Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm not going to st stop saying good morning until everybody says it back. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel like that teacher that I loved when I was in class. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the 2023 World Health Summit. Um, it is my great pleasure to be steering our first conversation of the day this morning. My name is Christine Mundwa, and I am going to be moderating our session today. We're looking at realizing the C in UHC. How do we realize the coverage in universal health coverage? We know that even where we've made gains at a national level, disparities within our communities, within our countries, remain one of the major challenges to realizing full extended coverage, making sure that we can get health services to everybody wherever they are uh, without financial burden. So it is these disparities that we want to particularly focus on today. We understand that people who are in remote regions, people who are in rural areas, it's particularly hard to reach these communities. So what do we have to do as we transform our health systems to make sure that we include these populations and how can technology help us in achieving that goal? Because we know that primary health care is a big part of that conversation in terms of reaching those communities. How do we transform our health systems to be able to make sure that our primary health care is effective in doing that specific jobs. And then, of course, it's the people behind this work, our health workers. How do we skill them, skill them enough uh, to be able to deal with the challenge at hand? And that is, of course, to deal with this disease burden uh, in a sustainable way, getting health to our communities. So I'm very excited um, about the people who you're going to be hearing from today because they're really involved in this operation at, a different, at different levels as stakeholders. But I'm also excited about some of your thoughts in the audience today. Um, you, World Health Summiteers, also have a very, very important aspect to add to this conversation, and I'm looking forward to your questions, your contributions uh, as we get along in this discussion. I won't say any more because I want us to watch a video now uh, that has been prepared for us, and that, in a way, is going to set the scene for our conversation today. So, tech team, let's have that video, and then we'll proceed with our day's conversation. Happy ako na meron ng MRI dito sa La Trinidad. Just imagine na Ang Platinidad is mountainous area, uh, hindi pa siya city, yet meron ng mga ganitong um, equipment. La clínica móvil sí es buena para la, las comunidades. Nos ahorra mucho con el tiempo de ir y hacer una cola allá y a ver si el médico te logra atender o llegar, porque tienen cierto, cierta hora para atender a siempre se llena, entonces es bueno que llegan y, y atienden a toda la comunidad. El país es un gran investimento en el sector de la salud. Tenemos aún, continuamos a tener grandes desafíos. Por tanto, creo que estamos a dar pasos firmes y seguros para la mayoría del sistema de salud en Angola. Y mejoró considerablemente. We have priced our MRI fees a little lower than the price they give in the other hospital out there in the city. We hope that can help our clients because this area actually is mostly farming. It's very fulfilling seeing uh, patients coming here and receiving what they came here for and us not having to ask them to go elsewhere for management. The dedicated Kassan Hospitals in Northeast is a safe island for thousands of cancer residents in this region. We've seen a reduction of mortality rate over the last decades of 30%, 40% for breast cancer. This is not translating to low and middle income countries. In fact, the mortality rates are growing and going to keep growing as population grow, the population aging aspect and the lifestyle changes. 
Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, frontline workers, which include community health workers, have selflessly risen to the challenge. The community health workforce, comprised largely of women, has also been instrumental in the dramatic expansion in access to essential health and nutrition services in countries around the world. So the question is, how are we going to make sure that all these positive changes that we're seeing in high-income countries can translate to low- and middle-income countries? Health and health equity is connected to everything and must be seen as an investment in all of society's growth and resilience for the present and for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, however technical at times our conversation will get, I think what this video did a very good job of communicating is the core of what is at our discussion today, and that is getting healthcare to everybody wherever they are. And so that should be in the back of our minds, um, even when the discussion gets a little bit complex when we discuss financing and the jargon of policy comes in. At the back of all of this is really taking healthcare to all the people who need it that we have, as a global community, made advances in the health sector. But those advances aren't necessarily being felt in low- and middle-income countries. And so today, we want to discuss how we can do this, to take this coverage to the most remote parts of the world, uh, to the people who desperately need it. Now, my next guest, or our first guest today, our keynote address, is going to be coming to us from His Excellency, Amrilo Shodovic Inoyatov. He is Minister of Health in the Republic of Uzbekistan. He's prepared a keynote for us. He's going to be telling us about the work that's being done in Uzbekistan to close that access gap, how they're transforming the health system there, building the capacity of healthcare workers, as well as how technology is driving UHC in Uzbekistan. Minister, thank you. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, dear professors and teachers, dear ambassador in our in Berlin, Shotake, dear Mrs. Christina Mundova, thank you for introducing and moderating this session. Dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to have the opportunity to address you from this panel discussion. The reforms undertaken in the health sector of Uzbekistan by the, in the leadership in, uh, the, of the, His Excellency Shaukat Mirziyoyev in the context of universal access to health care are being consistently continued. In Uzbekistan, the primary health care system has changed radically on the basis of completely new approaches. The Republic of Uzbekistan become as a social state which guarantees a decent life for every citizen. In Uzbekistan, where 37 million people live, more than 60 percent of them are children and young people, and about one million newborn is delivered per year. In Uzbekistan, many, for many centuries, under the name Mahalla of Uzbek Quarter, there existed a whole system of relations between residents of one quarter and significantly influenced the development of Uzbek tradition and life and was the keeper of Uzbek tradition. Personally, on the initiative of the deeply re respected president of the Republic of Uzbekistan, the Mahalla Institute, which has no analogies, no analogies in the world, was created in the country. These institutions, which is 
recent years has become an important bridge between the people and the country's leadership helps solve the social problems, social problems of fellow citizens by allocating resources from public funds. The main task of the medical teams working in the Mahalla, which is considered to be the smallest territory in the administrative unit of Uzbekistan, is to provide primary health care to the attached population of up to 2,000 people. As of September 1st, 2023, about 4,500 primary health care facilities serve 37 million people in, in the state. The system has established medical brigades to provide primary health care at the same level to compact and disparate population of Uzbekistan. As part of primary health care, 70 0.5 thousand medical teams were organized, including one family physician, one general practice nurses and midwife, and two patronage nurses. Moreover, to strengthen the system, 20 thousand nurses have been allocated to future, future expand primary health care. Pre-medical examination rooms were set up in family polyclinics and a general practice nurses position was introduced. Currently, is it, is it should be noted that the population dens density of Uzbekistan is uneven and differs, differs greatly in central and distant areas. For example, in Karakal, Pakistan, there are nine inhabitants per one square kilometer, while in the eastern part of the country there are, there are more than 600 inhabitants per one square kilometer. As a result, it was deci decided that doctors traveling to distant areas will be provided with additional salary and housing. In addition, one-step approach has brought health services closest to the community, which including followings. Primary health care facilities have been established, located within three kilometers of settlements. Pre-doctor's -do -pre examination rooms were established and the position of general practice, practice nurses was introduced. By, optimizi but by optim optimizing public patronage schemes and updated targeted system, the universal progressive patronage model was introduced. A referral for, the, for free medical care to district multidisciplinary central polyclinic and regional hospitals was introduced directly by a family doctor. A system of strategic pusher, pushers of medical service was introduced in order to provide all, all levels, layers, all layers of the population with quality and necessary medical care within the guaranteed package. The state medical insurance fund organized, organized the collection management and targeted and uh, effective as usual, usual of funds allocated from the state budget for the purpose of financing the guaranteed package. It was envisaged, envisaged that private medical organizations will be involved in the provision of medical service based on the guaranteed package. The effect effectiveness and effi efficiency of allocated budget funds is continuously mod monitor monitored by the fund. The information system and da database of electronic polyclinic and state medical insurance were created and put into full operation. 
screening programs for cardiovascular disease and diabetes among the population aged 40 and over, and for breast and cervical cancer among women over 35 have been introduced. For the early de de detection for of non-communicable disease and their risk factors. Specialized ambulance posts have been established in the emergency rooms of district city medical association in the areas of therapy and surgery. 46, 46 inter-district perinatal centers and conditions for the care of premature babies with a body weight of 500 grams have been established. Inter-district inter combined trauma and vascular center have been opened in areas and cities high-rise. On September 12th of this year, the strategy Uzbekistan 2030 was adopted, which defines the next seven years of Uzbekistan development. This document emphasizes the healthcare system, including the provision of primary healthcare to the population by improving the quality and efficiency of medical care until 2030. This document and the accompanying route map based on best foreign experience formulate a package of comprehensive reforms aimed at supporting a health, healthy lifestyle, proper nutrition and physical, uh, physical activity of citizens, prevention of disease using preventive and predictive measures based on international standards, elimination of critical gaps in the field of financing, service delivery, digital health, innovative family clinic, which is carried out using artificial intelligence, human resources, management and marketing in medical system, procurement, financial protection and quality of medical care, attracting direct investment, including the development of the private sector, including PPP. Once again, I would you like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister. I know you're also professor as well as doctor, and as somebody with neither of those titles, I wonder what the preference uh, for you would be. Do you prefer to be called minister or would you like to be called professor? <laughs> there's no difference. Minister there's says there's no difference. No difference. Um, no, absolutely. I think we'll stick with Minister because that really speaks to the service that you're doing for, for the people in, in the Republic of Uzbekistan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the Minister and I will be in good company uh, this morning because we have uh, a panel of experts from a wide range of uh, 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 stakeholder positions joining us now, and I'm going to call them up in this order. Anne Berg uh, is with the uh, Norwegian Red Cross, where she is Secretary General. Uh, we have Dr. Tatiana Wap. Well, here's what I think, friends. Thank you so much for initiating uh, that applause. But I think let's have them all up and then we'll do that one. And I will cue for the applause and it will be a rousing applause. Okay, so uh, we would have uh, Dr. Tatiana Wa. She is director and representative uh, for the Democratic Republic of Congo country office. Okay. Uh, UN Office for Project Services, uh, UNOP, what you might know as UNOP. Then we have Dr. Gitinji Gitahi. He is Global Chief Executive Officer and the Director General of AMREF Health. Uh, this is the Africa Group. Yeah. And um, last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Tisha Boatman. She's Senior Vice President for Global Access to Care uh, for Siemens Health Engineers. And now for the applause. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So realizing the C uh, in, in, in UHC, and, and I, I guess I want to start with you over there from, from a Red Cross perspective, because we, we, we all get a sense of the work that you do and uh, the context in which the Red Cross would, would be operating. Um, but how, from your perspective, and would you say, do we expand universal health coverage to be able to, to reach remote populations and I want to caveat that with without financial hardship. Well, thank you, Christine, and uh, I'm very happy to be here and to be on this panel this morning. Uh, I think we know a lot about what universal health coverage requires in, yeah. in to, you know, one aspect. I mean, we know there is a lack of work health force. We know there is a need for investments. We know there is high out-of-pocket spending. We know there is a need for medicines. We know a lot of things. Uh, but I think what we see in this, um, to make it happen, is that we lack on the four A's, as I like to call it, on the availability, on the accessibility, on the affordability, and on the acceptability. And also, I think we see when we, we come out to the rural areas and to people, um, that there is simply not a health system in place that can care for their needs. And I think we see that in conflict areas. We see it also mm. in, in areas prone to climate change and disasters. And then we're down to primary health care. Then we're down to mm -hmm. what we can do with mobile health teams, with volunteers, with what we can actually manage to train locally. Because there is a lot of barriers that we need to understand. It's about transportation, it's about out-of-pocket payments. And I mean, the Red Cross can do something. They, we, we have mobile clinics, we have teams, we, have, we train health workforce, uh, but there is still a need for a much wider approach, which means that I think we need to see the complementarity if we are to really reach UHC. Mm -hmm. We need to see that we need the volunteers, we need the local government, we need the national government, we need the private sector, we need Red Cross and Red Crescent. We need also the international community in order to yeah. utilize the complementarity. Because there are many different issues. And I visited Somalia earlier this year, and I spoke to a, a doctor in one of the clinics there, which is a mobile health clinic out in the rural areas. And they have a lot of acute malnutrition. And they give supplementary feeding. This is run by the Somali Red Crescent. But some of the children have severe acute malnutrition. They need to be referred. Transport is extremely expensive. So I asked her, what do you do then if you have a child that you see suffer for severe acute malnutrition, will not take the feeding that you will give to the mother? And she said, we will refer them to, uh, to a hospital. And I said, well, will they afford it? And she said, no. So they will go home. Yeah. So this is reality, and that's why we need to approach this, I think, in a complementary way. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Wa, I mean, this, this essentially requires a transformation um, of, of our health systems, and, and from, from where you're sitting, um, how can we bring quality health care to underserved communities? Well, certainly there's a complex array of challenges um, in achieving universal health care in Central Africa and much of the fragile states uh, in Africa. And, and maybe I, I'll answer through um, what we do in UNOPS um, to, to address some of these challenges. Um, we're probably the only UN agency that is mandated to, to focus on the implementation of infrastructure, uh, procurement, and project services, providing the needed Im uh, implementation capacities and the technical advisories to, to ministries, to governments, to actually really get to that. So going back to what uh, Anne was saying, it's, we see a, a, a huge problem in the implementation capacities mm. um, of the governments and, and of the partners in the field to actually get to these remote areas, to actually uh, get the access, to, to, to come up with the in innovative solutions, for example, when you're, uh, by taking in the in-country conditions, the realities of the, the countries themselves. For example, we don't just procure mobile clinics. We, we, we procure 
boat clinics. We procure um, multimodal solutions to get uh, access. Uh, you, you, you could take, you know, if you take Central Africa, there's a large population that's, that occupy forest communities. They go from savannas to, um, you know, from savannas to mountains, uh, to bordering or long rivers. So you have to really think of the, the sort of multimodal uh, ways to approach the, um, uh, the, the, the hard to access. But also, you know, we have to focus on achieving efficiency through scale and quality. Yeah. You can't just procure equipment and materials that are going to break down. And then that's what's happening, right? You have to have some longevity in what you procure for it because you know, particularly because these areas are, are have, um, or, or, or in remote uh, access areas, you're going to have to have it last longer, right? We have to have standardized processes. And of, of course, local, local sourcing of materials and service providers is, are really key in order to, to, to provide you know, a higher return on investments. So efficient uh, and transparent procurement is actually key because there's a lot of waste of resources. Um, um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, within the, the, the procurement of equipment, materials, to get to these resources. And, and adapted, and we need these adapted technologies, mm -hmm. right? There's, like Anne was saying, technologies galore exist, you know? How are they adapted to actually get to the access, yeah. to, the remote ac to, to the remote areas? And we do do that. And Tisha, I think I would like for you to pick up on that note, how we adapt this technology. Uh, to help us increase that access to get healthcare to, to those underserved communities. Yeah, I think um, the pa my fellow panelists have already hit on a couple of key points. Um, but when we start talking about the complexity of healthcare and the complexity in Africa in particular, but really a, a lot of low and middle income environments, there there is this aspect, and Anna brought it up first, which was this topic of multi-stakeholder partnerships, right? But I believe strongly that the responsibility needs to be different at different levels. And we were speaking beforehand, um, you know, there are global players and, and able to bring funding to play, but we've got to look at more funding that is appropriate in size and context for these environments. Sometimes when you talk to major organizations, arms of the World Bank, et cetera, they, they want to start at 20 million, at 50 million. Well, healthcare in a small country doesn't generally need that much money. So the good, the good news is we, we can't spend that much. Uh, but when we spend it, and this is, Tatiana made a very good point, it needs to be on high quality uh, services and including capacity building, including maintenance and ongoing supply of consumables, which is a huge topic. Uh, and taking to, into account the infrastructure needs, things like broadband is increasingly required to deliver adequate health care because that is how you enable some of the services that can empower local community health workers and strengthen their ability to deliver complex care. So I think we're on a good path. We have started, but I think we need to be a lot more consequent about who's responsible at what level and really drawing out that implementation uh, piece yeah. in order to ensure the innovation sticks and is sustainable. Yeah, um, and, and as you guys have been speaking, I, I sort of have a picture in mind about some of the, 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 the geographical locations that we're trying to reach people here, right? So we're talking about different terrain, um, and, and Minister, you did a very good job of uh, pointing out this direct correlation that we have um, between population density and access to healthcare. So we know that the more remote a region is, the more rural a region is, uh, the more difficult it is for these people, people in those communities to access healthcare. Technology is a big part of the conversation here, Minister, and I'm keen for you to tell us about how you think uh, or where you think the potential of digital solutions are to be able to, to get healthcare to people in, in rural and remote communities? And while Minister's getting that uh, translation, um, okay. he will be answering in Russian and we will get an English translation. Прежде всего, отвечать на ваши вопросы, я хотел 
еще один раз э, поблагодарить всем э, организаторам данной саммит. Before beginning to answer a question, I would uh, once again thank all of you and especially the organizers of this summit. На сегодняшний день в Узбекистане, э, да, действительно, географическое расположение э, наших населения разбросано. Э, из э, 37 населений, там э, около э, 30% процент э, населения живут в городе, остальные э, живут в селах. А для них... Mm -hmm. So, currently, the population of Uzbekistan, uh, the 37 million of Uzbeks are spread around the country in a very uneven way. Um, around 30% of the population live in urban centers, in big cities. The rest of the population is spread across the country. По международным стандартам, по требованиям Всемирного организации здравоохранения, каждые три километра радиуса должно быть семейная поликлиника. So, according to... Uh, WHO requirements um, a hospital or a family accessible hospital should be located in uh, the three kilometers radius. Like, so each three kilometers radius there should be an access to a hospital. В течение 15 максимум 20 минут пациент или больной должен идти в поликлинику. So that's in case of emergency, a patient can be brought to a hospital within 15 to 20 minutes. А Узбекистан достигла к этому на сегодняшний день в Узбекистане уже создано четыре с половиной тысяч таких семейных поликлиник. So by now we have completed the task of establishing 4.5 thousand of such policlinics that can actually answer this requirement. Все поликлиники сейчас отцифровизованы, электронные поликлиники, и плюс к этому мы сейчас начали внедрить uh, искусственный интеллект. So all the polyclinics uh, are digitalized, so they're fully digitalized, and we are beginning to implement artificial intelligence in healthcare. И uh, в этих поликлиниках мы uh, уже определили конкретно из uh, сегодняшних потребностях нашей населения, что мы можем э, медицински э, помогать нашим э, народам, нашим населением на семейной поликлинике, что можем помогать в районном медицинском объединении на стационарах, а что на вторых, вторичных э, областных уровнях медицины и что на третий уровень. Все это мы уже определили. So, and we have established like three levels of healthcare provision. One would be those polyclinics uh, that could uh, treat people without uh, stationary care. Then there would be uh, hospitals uh, for stationary care. And uh, for more complex issues, there are like uh, country district based uh, higher level health utilities already established. So we have established the needs and we have provided the solutions for this. На сегодняшний день наши э, семейные врачи и универсальный прогрессивный патронаж, которые к ним и прикреплены четыре медсестры сегодня, они э, каждый могут с помощью искусственного интеллекта в нашей электронной поликлинике ранее и точнее диагностировать любые виды нозологии. So uh, now we have uh, the teams of uh, family physicians uh, that we mentioned in this in the opening statement with uh, uh, four so-called patronage nurses at uh, his or her disposal at all times and with the digital tools and the uh, artificial intelligence tools already being implemented at the polyclinic level, we can at an early stage detect and diagnose uh, all sorts of disease. А теперь с компанией Симисом, которой пока еще аналогов в мире нету, сейчас планируем мощный модель, а этом, об этом я попозже хочу вам рассказать. And we are now together with uh, Siemens, uh, with the company providing us with uh, uh, cutting edge technology, we are establishing a model project uh, of which I would like to tell you later. Yeah. Thanks so much, Minister. You know, as you've been talking about these digital polyclinics, I'm thinking about um, an experience I had uh, in a grocery store the other day, right? The digitalized grocery stores where we can pay ourselves as, as the consumers. But I'm in the context of 
a clinic. This is not practical. You need health workers, uh, Dr. Gitai. You will never get to, to a point where a patient can walk in and treat themselves. Um, so, so we still need our health workers. How do we upskill them? Um, in, in this context, right? What, what kind of skills do we need to be uh, uh, putting into our health workers in this regard? And, and tell us about the work that you're doing at Amref University uh, on that note. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, first, I would like to start by appreciating the organizers for the balance, the gender balance on this panel. I think we need to clap for them, and I really want to make sure that in every panel you go to, there's no good gender balance. Please keep count, because we want to hold ourselves accountable. So thank you very much for that. The next thing I want to ask is how many of you are from Africa, like myself? If you're here and you came from Africa, raise up your hand. Wonderful. Wonderful. Please yeah. thank the German government for all the visas, because that's, uh, <laughs> that's always a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I also want to point out, um, I was astonished to see how big the Africa Room was. Um, it's, not, it's not at every conference that the Africa Room is so big, so that's also one uh, to take back to the organizers. Back to you, Dr. Kitai. Absolutely. Yeah. And for all those who didn't get the visas, we pray that you'll get them next time. <laughs> so, um, I think I just want to uh, uh, first frame this conversation on the health workforce, and thanks for all the comments here, because again, uh, we're talking about access, quality. Uh, we know from WHO data and other reports that Africa has the lowest density of health workforce. But many of you who come from Africa also know that probably Africa has one of the highest number of jobless health workers. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a kind of uh, an enigma. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one of the highest number of unemployed health workforce. So that's an important thing to realize in the, um, uh, in the context that I'm, of what I'm going to say. Uh, because it's important to recognize that the challenge of access is also tied to the fiscal space problems, you know, the, the money available to government to do this work. Uh, to just give you a very quick number, most of the African countries, if you average the total expenditure on health tax expenditure, is $50 per person per year. That's a lot. Five zero. When you're doing very well, many yeah. governments are 17. <laughs> Uh, you know, so 50 is actually my back of the envelope calculation, but some governments are 17, mm -hmm. others are a little higher. My own country is 43, you know, in terms of, and that's Kenya, which is, a, you know, going to low middle income country. Mm -hmm. Put that in perspective, here in Germany, in most of the European countries, $4,000 per person per year. Mm -hmm. wow. So you're trying to do a $4,000 per person per year with $40. <laughs> this is the reason why, even as we talk about training health workforce, yeah. we have to remember that we are training health workforce that governments are unable to absorb. So that is important to realize because then we, are, we have to ask ourselves when we train them, what are we training them to do and where are we training them to go? And this is why it's important that we put this conversation in perspective of technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, how these health workers must also be able to create their own channels of actually providing care without necessarily having to depend on government employment. So how do they use technology and innovation yeah. to be able to offer services without necessarily being uh, employed by government? So this, this is an important conversation. And technology is an enabler of that because if you have a nurse who's trained and they have a handheld ultrasound machine, they can actually go to the community and they can offer services mm -hmm. and then you can discuss how that access is paid for. So there, there are certain areas here. But so in terms of our work, uh, because AMREF as the largest health development organization in the continent has a university and that university is a university of primary health care specifically. Mm -hmm. So we train health workforce for primary health care. So we focus on community health workers, community health extension workers. We focus on nurses, midwives, biomedical technologists to ensure that there's continuity of the equipment that we put in that they can be repaired. We are looking at laboratory diagnostic capacity, uh, epidemiologists, so that actually all the technology and the investments that is done is highly optimized. The most important thing to realize that for us in Africa, you can't throw money at the problem because we don't have the money to throw at the problem. So efficiency is the most important yeah. thing. So we train, we want to train health workforce for efficiency. Mm -hmm. But in this efficiency, we recognize that um, there are major shifts that are happening in that we also have to uh, ensure that this health workforce is aware. Number one is climate change and health. 
that the future is going to be completely different. It's going to be different because we will need a warning systems, disease surveillance. Therefore, we can't pay attention only to doctors and specialists. We have to pay attention to laboratory technologies. We have to pay attention to community health workers who actually become the foundation for disease surveillance and early warning systems. Mm -hmm. That is what we have learned from the climate change and the pandemic threats that are happening. Secondly, is that we have a huge population shift, a huge uh, youth population. You know, 70% yeah. of our people are below 35 years. That means that adolescent health, mental health services, and nutrition are critically important. Yeah. What that means is that we have to repurpose the curriculums of the people we are training. Because when I went to school as a medical doctor, mental health was a psychiatry lesson, which happen it happened and that was it. There was no mental health foundation underlying everything that we're doing. Adolescent health means that access to family planning for adolescents is extremely important. That was not a topic that we were taught in school. So we have to repurpose these things. The next thing that we have to think about is technology. Technology as an enabler, but also technology as a, a, a creator of inequity, because where technology is available, it's extremely important, but there are places where mm. it is not. But we also know that technology is also promoting mental health illness and depression because of you know, the, the, uh, you know, what young people are seeing and consuming. So we have to think about technology more holistically. Mm -hmm. And the other shift uh, that we have to pay attention to is equity. Because of what I said earlier, that even as we create this access, we have to ask ourselves who has, ac who has access to that technology? Because as I say, the fiscal space is so low that access and the, uh, you know, uh, payment by government is scarce. So people have to pay out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So when we create, when we have, um, you know, an MRI, we have all these things, how do we enable equity so that people have access uh, to those things? So we are training our health workforce to recognize all these things and to be aware of these things that are happening. And finally, is non-communicable diseases, an area that has not been paid attention to because we paid attention to communicable diseases a lot in the continent. We were trained to treat malaria, HIV, you know, diarrhea and uh, tuberculosis. But the rise in, in cancer, the rise in hypertension and diabetes means that our health workforce needs to be repurposed for these things, not a tertiary and secondary care, but for primary and community care. And they have to know that they have to be people-centered and community-led. So I think those are the things I would like right. to mention in terms of our approach as a university on training health workforce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Kitai. Teacher, I want to rope you back in here because, of course, technology and as an enabler, and I want to come back to health workers um, operating in, in, in these regions and we're learning about the skills that they need, uh, especially at a primary level, uh, primary care level. So, so what are you, t tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing um, to, to help develop health workers in this regard. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things are important. We invest quite a bit in training um, and education on the equipment that we s install, but also the services. So I think training and education cannot be only how to operate a piece of equipment. It also needs to be how to optimize a pathway. As, as uh, Dr. Gatahi was just saying, I mean, efficiency is really important. So it's not just a matter of keeping a piece of equipment running, but it's, it's doing so so that as many people as possible can benefit from that. That also helps with the economics of the overall topic. I think another topic um, is really important around the use of AI and the use of digital tools. No matter how well trained a community health worker is, they will encounter things they haven't seen before, right? They will encounter cases uh, that are not familiar to them. So what access do they have to sort of online training to take a quick look, a, a quick refresher look? Can they reach out to a specialist virtually? Is that possible either you know, with internet or with even M house or with a mobile phone? What, what kind of data and information can they collect in order to make an important decision right then? I think important to understand in a lot of these communities, you're lucky to see the patient once. If you send the patient away, it's not likely to get that patient back, right? And so increasingly, we really wanna look at the same day turnaround. And I just wanna to touch on one other thing that a few of my colleagues have said, but it's just so important. Is this topic of prevention and early diagnostics? Yeah. It is not economically viable to treat a lot of non-communicable diseases in developed countries when they're caught very late. So there's the economic aspect, there's the clinical outcome aspect, but if we're not looking for and enabling our community health workers and our, and our community clinics in order to look for and, and support things in non-communicable diseases, patients present way too late. 
if they present at all, right? Mm -hmm. And it's much more true in these communities where there's a lack of patient education and just knowledge of yeah. what kinds of signs and awareness to, to uh, things to look for, especially as we sort of still have plenty to do in communicable diseases, but transition to saying people are surviving waterborne illness, they're surviving many of these uh, early stage type of diseases, and what happens when they get into middle age and you have things like diabetes becoming an increasing factor and, and cancer and things like that. So it's important that we continue to develop the overall system as well, that it, it doesn't stop with the, the, the treatment of the more essential type of diseases mm -hmm. and that we look at the prevention aspects and screening aspects for non-communicable diseases. And I want to come to you in a moment, but I just want to get a sense from our friends in the room. If, if there are any questions, can you just uh, indicate by raising your hands? Uh, okay, I see one, two, three, four. Okay, so I think that tells us that we need to perhaps be winding down here so that we can open to the floor. Uh, and so I'm, I'm talking about the, the wider Red Cross movement now, and I know that you're involved uh, specifically in, in discussions with policymakers to include all communities in national health strategies. Just tell us about that. Yeah, I think the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, um, it goes back to what Tisha said earlier. There is different roles in, in and we need to know what, who's doing what and in this complementarity that we're seeking. And in the Red Cross, Red Crescent, the role is typically to be auxiliary to the government, which means that there is support for the government in the countries that they are. Red Cross and Red Crescent, you will find them in 192 countries, so basically all over the world. And I think what makes it very much an asset in the health system is that it is locally based. So there are people on the ground, they have been trained, they run mobile health clinics, they run teams, they run health training, they run hospitals, they run a variety of services in their national context. And that means that, for instance, when there is an earthquake in Herat, in Afghanistan, or now what we see in the Middle East, the Palestinian Red Crescent and our sister society in Israel are on the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this also brings me to something which complicates it a little bit even further, and that is we have around 100 armed conflicts in the world today. So if we're really looking at vulnerable populations, there is also the protection of health workforce issue which comes into this, which we haven't touched upon. Yeah. And I think um, what Tisha said about technology, I think technology can be used very well and we need rapid testing technologies. We need a lot of technology that we can use in different areas, also in conflict zones. But access of healthcare is, and health workforce is still an issue. Uh, there's been people killed now in the Middle East, paramedics, ambulance drivers, in Ukraine, there's been 1,150 health facilities that has been affected by the war. This means that we need also to secure a room for humanitarian action, for health, mm. for assisting in these areas where there is also protracted crisis, crisis that goes on for decades. It's not just for a couple of years, yeah. it's for a long time. So this also uh, is uh, something that I think goes back to why we really need to invest in local capacity, capacity on the ground, capacity that can be there when mm. a situation arises. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Wa, perhaps I will just give you another opportunity to maybe expand on maybe a single point about the work you do at UNOP really to help uh, your, your, your partner states build strong and resilient um, health systems. I mean, a lot of it really comes down to increasing and expanding their capacity to be able to implement. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have partners, for example, on health um, infrastructure mapping. It is something that, that we very much like to push because it goes back to um, the serious need for effective strategic planning in the health sector at all levels. Mm -hmm. huh? Um, and, and, and moreover, the need for stronger collaboration between partners, private sector, NGOs, uh, the UN system, and in, in government. That without it, you can't do it. And so some of what we, a lot of what we do is actually to get at that collaboration. How do we get the private sector, the, the NGOs, the, the universities, because you can't do without it, research centers and universities to collaborate and better planning 
because without effective planning, you can't do it. So the, the example of how to really set up a good preparedness in alert center, emergency alert centers. Uh, how, how do you do that without collaborating um, and, and planning? And so the kind of project management and implementation um, capacities that we provide is to go at these, yeah. very, uh, these very two serious areas where I believe that uh, we need to do for, for fragile states mm -hmm. and fragile situations as well as vulnerable people everywhere. Mm -hmm. All right, friends, uh, let's maybe open up to the floor now. Um, I did see, yes, your hand was first. So here's, here's the thing. My good friend Patrick um, has a mic with him. We also have one on the aisle. <laughs> so two microphone stands in the aisle. So if you're able to get to the aisle, please do so. If not, please keep your hand up, right? So there is, uh, the lady is here at the first one. There's one at the back. If you're not able to make it to the aisle, um, my colleague Patrick will bring a mic to you. So if you are able to go to the mic stand, please do so. Um, and then we'll reserve uh, the handheld mic to people who cannot physically get to the, to the mic stands. So ma'am, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Dr. Serena Cruz and I'm here uh, part of the Global uh, Alliance for Access to Surgery, Obstetrics, Trauma, Anesthesia Care. We're known as the G4 and I'm with a member organization, IGPC. Um, infrastructure, I love hearing it, Tisha, thank you. That's really important. But I also appreciate um, our good CEO here of AMREF, the discussion around absorption of resources. Yeah. Um, but I have not heard about climate. Mm -hmm. And I do love these summits because we tend to, in our best, try to bring in a lot, but we still verticalize. Um, the Alliance is about advocating for SODA, right? Surgery, mm -hmm. obstetric, trauma, anesthesia care, conflict, mm -hmm. peacetime. But the question mm -hmm. is, when we talk about infrastructure and we're talking about the mobilization of resources and we're talking about the absorption in terms of financing, right? Not every project's 20 million, mm -hmm. some are just two. What are we doing to synthesize infrastructure when it comes to UHC and climate? And in terms of workforce, mm -hmm. gender. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, ma'am. Can I get the second question in? Uh, the gentleman at the back. Yes. Hi, uh, I am Dr. Vikas Agarwal. I am from International SOS India. The question is that it's very interesting to see the private sector involvement and the technology and digital solution, but I would like to hear the thoughts on the sustainability given the commercial angle of how the investment uh, how private sector can see as the profitable or are we seeing only as the charity from the private sector into this? Any thoughts around that on the sustenance of this? Thank you. Thanks very much. If you will allow me, let's address these. Um, and you can please stay at the position. Please, ladies and gentlemen, go to the mic stands uh, if you have questions. Patrick, please bring a mic to the front. Dr. Gitai, uh, please take the first question and Tisha, please take the second one. And then we'll do another round. Um, thank you, and yeah, that's your question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, her, her question. Okay. Yes. Um, so you asked, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the key areas you talked about were climate and gender, those two. And I would like to ask you to comment on climate and technology because out of the infrastructure coming out it needs to be, you know, we, we, we are, of course, talking about climate responsiveness and we are talking about reducing carbon emissions, but we are also talking about adaptation and also climate resilient health systems back home. And um, uh, one of the, and then there is, there is a gender issue. Let me start with the gender issue. The first thing that we, we know all of us is that the health system and the health services are delivered by women. 70% of the health workforce is women. But we know there's a challenge that the leadership is actually male. So this is a problem that we have to address. We know we're addressing that um, through not only developing leaders in the women, because women don't have a problem. It's not the women we are fixing. It is institutional change that is needed to allow women to actually rise to lead a sector that they actually are the ones who are the majority. 
And those institutional changes require policy, legislation, they require gender lens, they require all these things that we have to work on. So that is at the center of everything we are doing. Um, that means also that we have to change the institutions where the women are working. That's the Ministry of Health. We have to change the institutions like ourselves and all this. So that's a big topic. And if we had time, I think that's a topic for a, a whole conversation. On this other side of, um, uh, of climate, we know that uh, the neglected or the orphan is actually health in climate change. Mm. We realize that there's a lot of conversation on mitigation, reduction of greenhouse gases, but there has, we, we have to acknowledge that the, the, ch the change has already happened. And we are seeing flooding, we are seeing changes in malaria patterns, we are seeing changes in nutrition, we are seeing all these changes. The question is, mm. how do we repurpose our health workforce to realize those changes and to be ahead of them? How do we ensure that the equipment that we get, the infrastructure and the technology is actually aware and climate resilience aware? How do we use our health workforce and also technology to, to create early warning systems? The Marburg outbreak in Tanzania was actually realized and reported through a mobile phone by a community health worker who had been trained for surveillance on Ebola, and they realized that change was happening, and they reported it through an electronic event-based surveillance. That's how it was actually managed and controlled, and one of our colleagues from Tanzania is here. So uh, what you're raising is really important, and we just have to make sure that our infrastructure and our health workforce is responsive to both gender, inclusivity, and, and climate change. Let me f uh, make one 30 second thing. The other thing I forgot to talk about health workforce <laughs> is about inclusivity of differently enabled people. I think that when I went to school, I was never taught sign language. I was never taught how to read Braille. Right. Even our materials don't actually recognize that inclusivity. So that's another thing that we must recognize as we talk about um, inclu inclusion. Okay, Thank you. fantastic. Um, to, to this same question. Yeah. Okay, please. Yeah, uh, actually, my bad. I should have um, really, really uh, uh, um, sp speak to uh, sustainable infrastructure implementation because we run the gamut. Hard and soft infrastructure, we build blood banks, we build mm -hmm. oxygen plants, we build labs, etc. cetera, uh, across Africa and, 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 of course, the world. So, and we take particular care um, on climate resist, uh, resilient and, and disaster, you know, the, the infrastructure that responds to environmental shocks. But more, more importantly, the cultural appropriateness of such infrastructure, which is what not, this is not what you find uh, on model or typical um, health, health um, clinics, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, blueprints. Um, and usually, they're not captured the renewable energy supply that needs to be done, nor the water needs for, for health infrastructures, right? We tie all of that in. But most importantly, to get at uh, what, what uh, the great doctor has just said, um, local to get at the climate resilience and uh, the climate issue, local materials and supplies has we, we, we has to be used. That's the only way you're going to reduce uh, emissions. That's the only way you're going to, 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 to deal with even getting at capacity building for, 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 for locals to adjust and to better understand their own environment. So uh, going at, and, and that's a focus for you, Knox, to use the local materials, local labor, and capacity built to, uh, to engage in in managing your own environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tisha, just that second question, please. Yes, so I, if I understood the question correctly, it was about sustainability and how do businesses and corporate look at it. So I'm gonna speak on behalf of Siemens Health and Airs because that's where I've worked for 18 years and some of these things might apply to other companies, but I really feel I should only speak on behalf of my own. Um, and we absolutely see healthcare access as a sustainable business for us. If you look at it, there's over 4 billion people that don't have access to high quality healthcare. There's a significant business opportunity in that. There's a rising middle class and mm -hmm. even at a very, very low price point of, of $50 uh, dollars per year able to spend on healthcare, only a small portion of the population 
needs those advanced services and procedures. And when you have volume, you can absolutely build a business upon that. So this is something where we start any project or any topic from a sustainable long-term basis because the one-time pilot isn't super great for the community that we're trying to serve and it's not a good business prospect either. Uh, so we're always starting from the beginning of how does this play out over time? Mm -hmm. How do we get to not just the pilot, but the millions having access and, and amortize the topic? Sure, we do some charity and donation, um, but there's a very good business to be made in doing good. And I th hope more and more companies understand that. Okay. Uh, so panelists, I'm going to be spurring you on because I, I would like to to, to make sure we have good coverage in terms of the questions that we can cover in the room today. So I'll be very undemocratic and say, one summit here, one question, one answer, once only. Not very democratic, <laughs> but it'll help us get through everybody. So I want very quick questions um, and perhaps directed to a single panelist, please, um, my fellow summiteers. Thank you, ma'am, please go ahead. Thank you, um, Florence Temu uh, from Amref as well in Tanzania. Mine is more of an opinion, but can be also looked into uh, uh, as a question or, or suggestion. I think it's high time that now we simplify messages of universal health coverage, particularly the word coverage, because we, on the demand side, there's a lot of influences in the communities. And I was about to talk about the Marburg example that uh, Githinja said already, so I won't go there, but had it not been the rumors in the community that were detected, wouldn't have discovered early in, enough about the Marburg. But you see the same situation where traditional healers who are not being reached with these messages are very influential in our communities. We've been able to reach out to those side on the community side because communities also have their way of defining diseases, even looking for solutions. So I think it's in the, in the inclusivity aspect. Let's ensure that the community influences, particularly traditional healers, are reached they are very affordable, reachable, accessible. The same message that we talk about UHC, but on the flip side of the coin. So I think uh, for me here is to emphasize that we need high time to simplify messages so that we, we include everyone, especially the influencers in our community settings. Thank, Thank you. you ma'am. That input from Tanzania, I'm seeing all of you, but there was a question here in the front. So please, can we have this question? Thank you very much, everyone, also for having time. Let me stand for all of you to see. And also thank you for inviting me as a deaf person from Nairobi, Kenya, LV City Health, uh, from a local organization in Kenya. So my name is Joseph Barazo. I'd like to thank you also for those who supported me to come for this conference and my interpreter as well. I'd like to mention that I work as a disability officer in our local organization, LV City Health, <clears throat> and we work in about 34 counties uh, in Kenya. I've uh, been there for about 15 years. Now, I just have two questions for the panel that are there. One is that in uh, the book that we've just received, I've seen the talk about inclusivity, but in the panel, I'd like to see where is the inclusivity for some like us, a person mm -hmm. with disability in your panel? Question. That question. is question number one. You've also mentioned that all persons with disability need to be involved in different areas of health. Uh, do you have any story from your reports on persons with disability? I've had nothing from the reports Thank you've you. given. Thank you very much, sir. We've noted that question. I want to take, so we have two mic stands. So the, the mic stand at the back, if we can get a question from there. The microphone is coming, so the gentleman uh, in the front of the line. Patrick is on his way with the microphone. He'll be there in a second. So I have, uh, it's the, the inc inclusivity question is one question, right? You've heard it, it's, it's 1.2 and Yeah, uh, yeah thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I'm in Kaoma Center from WHO HRP. My question is uh, to uh, Professor Gita. Um, I would just like to ask about uh, the concept of people-centeredness in also achieving UHC and how a community health worker can support empowering individual in promoting their own health, maintaining their health, coping with illness and disability with or without the help of her healthcare worker. Um, and this may be a solution towards achieving the C in UHC. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, somebody has to tackle inclusivity. Dr. Kitai, that one was for you. Yeah. 
Tanzania was an input, so not a question. So I'll take one more question, ma'am. Hello. Uh, I'm uh, Letitia Van Haren, oh. and I have an app for pregnant women to connect them with the healthcare providers in the rural areas. Everybody is really enthusiastic about it, but the Vodacom, the, all the international operating the, uh, companies, they make a big problem. I ask the governments, please get order there, put them in line and make sure that poor people have access to internet, that we can teach them digital literacy. It's just as necessary for all that you propose as uh, normal literacy was before. That's really the stumbling block that we have now, and I can see that the fruit is ripe and it's going to rot for the rural people if we do not right. get this support. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, in the front here. Thank you very much. My name is Cecilia Senu. I work with Hope for Future Generations, a community-based women-led organization in Ghana. My question is on collaboration, which we have talked a lot about. Collaboration with communities, co collaboration with civil society organizations, promoting primary health care at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. I realize that we've been doing a lot. All the discussions here is talking a lot about medical treatment curation, uh, curative health. And I think it is time we start thinking a lot of preventive health, investing more resources into preventive health because we believe that prevention is better than cure so that people don't get very chronic diseases coming to hospitals and we invest more. And so I want us to start thinking of targeted way of engaging civil society organizations, community-based organization, community-led organization right. to ensure that we address this. The second one is now we realize- Ma'am, is there a question for us there? <laughs> a lot of our health workers are now leaving our countries. Yes. And we realize that the health workforce, especially in Ghana, is becoming very, difficult for us to address many challenges. Now, why I'm advocating for this is that we can also train civil society organizations to support where there are gaps, to have a way of bridging those uh, health uh, problems in the communities that we live. Thank you. Thanks very much, ma'am. So I didn't get a question there, but thank you for that input. So I want one more question from you, please, ma'am. A question. Is it a question? Yes. Yes. So thank you so much. My name is Rosemary Mboru, Executive Director for Waki Health. We also coordinate the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030, among others. So it's about um, inclusivity. And the, quest, the point is that for us to achieve, to close this gap on innovation specifically, we need to see more inclusion within the global health uh, ecosystem. With Act A, we saw how low and middle income countries were left behind. Mm -hmm. We saw how, how high income countries vaccinated their populations before any of the low and middle income countries could get there. So for us to get this from central to rural, we mm -hmm. still, we have to actually fix a lot, you know, at the global level within the architecture. So how do we move forward, especially in terms of ensuring localization, mm -hmm. in terms of ensuring that we are not leaving behind low and middle income countries in ensuring that when the next pandemic happens, Africa will not be last on the queue. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Wa, I would already prepare you to take that one for us. Um, <laughs> but that's not what you'll do first because we had the question about inclusivity. And Tisha, please take the one about the internet situation. Um, I, I just assume that you're operating in the digital space that also is, is, is up your alley. And then there was one question for you, uh, Dr. Gitai. Who, what should we do about the, the, the inclusivity? Uh, the gentleman rightly pointed out that we have to be cognizant of all of our uh, community stakeholders. So we had the question about inclusivity uh, here today. So maybe that is one we will park, but Dr. Gitai, if I can spur you on now to take the question that was directed to you. Tisha will do you, you next, and then uh, Dr. Wa. Okay, so um, I think, uh, would you like me to comment on that very quickly? If, if you, yeah. yeah. So my colleague, thank you very much. I think uh, you're right that we have to, to be absolutely inclusive and that's, um, that's about adding the U to the C. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say universal, what is really, what's universal? The yes. C is the coverage, but the U must mm -hmm. be part of the C and that means that all people, yes. and especially the ones that we know are most left behind must be first. I think that that's a really, really important point. So thanks for, for raising that. I want to comment, and, and it's related to actually the next question, which is about community uh, people-centeredness and community-centeredness and community leadership. 
The challenge that we've had, which is also back to the question that was raised by, or the comment that was brought here, is that we built a health system for disease. This is the challenge. Even when you look at the WHO, you look at WHO health system building blocks, they don't have people in the center. They're actually based on supply side, that we will treat you when you're sick and you need health services, you know, you need uh, service delivery, you need health workers, you need this and that. People are the most important building block of a health system. But the building blocks we're talking about are healthcare building blocks. So the first thing we need to say is that WHO needs to review the building blocks because the governments use them to plan and must put people at the center. Now, if we do that, then we know that actually it is the people who have the power to keep themselves healthy. And that should be our most important uh, goal. The most important goal of the health system should be to keep the people healthy. And how do you do that? We do that by giving the, the, the communities the knowledge for them to actually use their existing mm. power to keep themselves healthy. That's why we use community health workers. That's why we use local religious leaders. That's why we use local opinion shapers. And that is the work that we do every day. Now, what we need to do is enable them by paying community health workers, for example, so they are part of the formal health system and they're not seen as volunteers and most of the money and all the money in the health system is financing tertiary and secondary care. If we are going to have a future that is safe, we must create the foundation of primary health care and the foundation of universal health coverage on mm. community leadership, people-centeredness, right. and inclusivity, where the U is actually part of the C. That's Thank what you I'm so saying. much. Internet. So the question around internet access, Tisha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, internet access is quite important, but it doesn't have to be the only way, right? So we are working with a number of infrastructure companies and looking at better, you know, uh, and more accessible internet in remote locations. But it's also important that a lot of things can be made available offline. And almost all of the training that we um, have available to, say, community health workers, to, to nurses and staff, is available offline. It's something they can download and use as needed. We've, we can't rely so much um, uh, fully on, on internet access, but it is something that we look at and consider an, an important part of infrastructure development. I think one advantage internet has in terms of other aspects of enabling healthcare is there are different funding channels out there and there are substantial amounts of funding um, and often to the question that was commented before, you can tie that to climate, right? So, th so there's, a, there, there's a sophistication level here of building systems where internet uh, sourcing is maybe a little easier to solve than say some of the other types of infrastructure, I would say. Dr. Wa? Yeah, um, I think uh, you're, very, you're quite right. Uh, in less developed countries, you do see that several interventions within the ecosystem of health are disparate, carried pell-mell across national territories with little coordination among the actors, right? And hardly one leverages what one does with the other. But it's the same, same in the funding landscape, right? Requiring the investments to pull together but fundamentally, it's a, it's, it goes back to a lack of effective strategic planning and, and leadership, frankly, right? So um, I, I take the minister of Uzbekistan, who took the bull by the horn. You lead for this strategic planning and for the efficiencies that you need and the coordination that you need within country. And so I, I go back that, you know, ecosystem globally is something, but I think you were talking mostly e ecosystem and within some national boundary or international boundaries, you know, uh, uh, within Africa, that needs to be resolved through health leadership uh, in country. Thank you. So the gentleman at the second mic stand, your question, please, sir. Yes. So my name is Mustafa Kamala. I'm a junior doctor from Kurdistan, Iraq. Mm -hmm. So uh, s seeing as the first hand experience of the healthcare system in a low to middle income country, I can see that there's a, a lot of room for improvement in the health infra infrastructure and also the health system. So my question is how can we hold governments to be accountable in working on that there's a lot of international organizations helping in building these health infrastructures, but I don't see them as sustainable as the local and national government working on that. And secondly, how can youth doctors or young healthcare workers be a part of that accountability in moving forward in realizing the coverage in UHC? 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll ask the, the lady behind you to ask her question. Thank you very much. My name is Esther, Deputy Minister of Health from Namibia. And I want to thank the panelists as well. I have one or two questions. The first one is that it's true that um, we have to realize the C in the UHC, but um, ensuring that it's not only a health um, sector issue, but it also demands a multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary mm -hmm. approach. So my question to the panelists is, how do you in your respective countries work with other sectors to increase or to realize the health coverage? And what are the challenges involved in the respective countries, especially on the issues of uh, good coverage, access to not only water, but clean water, um, road, um, good road infrastructures, as well as uh, sanitation facilities? I thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Health Minister. Um, and I have to say, we will only be answering one of those questions <laughs> because we have to be fair to everybody. Uh, so uh, the panelists here have the, the luxury of taking their pick and I suspect they'll go for the easiest one. Um, ma'am, you one question from you please, ma'am, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, good morning, my name is Katerina. My name is Katerina Kirtos. I come from the uh, International Federation of Medical Students Associations. And my question is more, more directed uh, at Anne. And how do you see the role of medical students and the involvement of youth organization, uh, especially in regards to achieving uh, UHC through spreading access to technology and these global systems uh, all around? All right, Anne, why don't we just get underway with that one? Well, thank you. Uh, I think the youth uh, and the young doctors that, that we have around the world play an absolutely crucial role because a l big part of the world in low and middle income countries are also very young people. And I think you can also um, contribute largely to what the gentleman before asked about, to the accountability issue. How do we keep governments accountable? By asking questions, by raising the voice, by telling what's going on in my community, what do we see? And I think in that, that the Young Medical Associ Students Associations also have a very important role to play. Thanks very much. Okay, so we have um, two questions here. There was the accountability question, um, as well as one question from the Deputy Health Minister uh, in, in Namibia. Uh, so perhaps Dr. Gitaya can pick up with you because those are sort of... Yeah. So I could start off with the one of the uh, accountability. Uh, the large portion of health workforce is actually young people. So it's, I think the young people is their population. It's not like a group that needs, it's their young people who are leading health service delivery. And we are training more and more and is the ones who are entering the health workforce. The challenge that I find is that in this space, especially in the countries that I know of, there's no interdisciplinary approaches to these challenges. We find that doctors are approaching their challenges individually. We find that nurses are approaching their issues individually, and so are each of the other disciplines or cadres. My recommendation is that for real change to happen in the country, on the health sector, we have to have interdisciplinary associations of this change. And the accountability needs to be interdisciplinary. And how does that happen? All the different associations, whether they are nursing, they are doctor associations, they are you know, biomedical technologies need to come together and then identify the cross horizontal uh, issues that are there and then use parliamentarians, local government, national government to address these issues in a sustainable manner in a way that is encoded in law. On the issue of, um, that was raised by the Deputy Minister, it is actually a big uh, injustice to the people that we put all our money in, in care delivery, and we actually, even when we talk about health financing, we only count what is used to buy medicines to pay uh, health workforce. We don't actually consider investments in health, in water, and sanitation mm -hmm. as health investments. This is a big injustice because then, when you talk to the Minister of Water and Sanitation, they're thinking of dams for irrigation. They are not thinking of clean water in the informal centers. And therefore, we are spending our time treating people on diarrhea. Diarrhea is the largest killer in Africa, followed by pneumonia. Why? Because of 
lack of clean water and sanitation. And then we spend all our money treating. So intersectoral collaboration mm -hmm. is the most important thing, bringing cabinet ministers into, such, into committees that address health, not health care. I think the point he's raising is critical importance, yes. and uh, I don't think we can address all of it right now. But the basis of healthy communities is actually water and sanitation mm -hmm. and nutrition. Mm -hmm. Yes. Minister. Minister, I thought maybe you should also weigh in on the question around how to hold um, our policymakers accountable. Um, you heard the question from, from the young doctor there. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Прежде всего, я хочу отметить, здесь нужен создать, создать правильную архитектуру здравоохранения. I would like to stress that, first of all, uh, that, that the right uh, and appropriate architecture of uh, healthcare provision should be created on each level. А потом... Все, все, все развивающие страны, все, всячески развивающие страны, многие смотрят расход в здравоохранение как затрата. Так не должно быть. Это должно быть как инвестиция. So, and the, the spending, like the national spending for healthcare should, shouldn't be treated as cost, but as an investment. And uh, that's not happening on a sufficient level. Инвестиция человечества это самая uh, важная вещь. So we need to make investment into people. That is the most important factor. Уважаемый коллега очень правильно сказал только что uh, здесь нужен комплексно подходить uh, ко всему реформу. My distinguished colleague has uh, stated it already that we need an, a comprehensive uh, approach to those questions. Узбекистан сегодня смотрит ко всему этому реформу очень комплексно и очень быстро это реализуется. So in Uzbekistan we are developing, we have already established a comprehensive approach to these issues and we are realizing it very quickly. Если смотрим на историю Германии после Второго мирового войны, вся эта страна, город была разрушена. If we look at Germany after World War II, Germany laid uh, in ruins. Ну, немецкие ученые тогда правительство первую очередь все средства выделяли на образование и медицину. And uh, when a new government was established, first of all, there was there was a huge emphasis on first of all on the health of the nation and. Uh, and education. Th there was an uh, yes. investition-wise emphasis on educating uh, health specialists. Развитое образование потом поднял государство на этом уровне. And a high level of development in terms of education has raised the development of other areas, has, has raised uh, the state capabilities in healthcare. Это простой аксиома. It's uh, actually a simple axiom. Если у страны, вот как у Африки тоже только что сказали, что 70% населения это young people. So it was already said that in Africa on average like 70% of the population are young people. Они должны, правительство должно больше выделять внимание на образование и на здоровые нации. So education is key for yes. the health of the populations. И мы уверены, это дает э, свой, через э, некоторые лет, э, дает но, новый, мощный свой импульс. And uh, it will, in several years' time, it, we will already, we can already start harvesting the fruits of this. Узбекистан такую реформу уже, э, уже лет пять, уже давно начал. Узбекистан has begun such reforms uh, around five years ago. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I really, I've been given the two-minute warning mark. <laughs> what I can say 
to the two uh, summiteers in the front here. Please come over here because as soon as I close this session, you can come directly to them. This is a privilege I will afford you because I have to take uh, the microphone away from you now uh, and close the session. So please come and wait in the wings here if, if you so wish because really when we have closed the session, uh, you can ask your questions directly. Uh, same applies to you, ladies at the back. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. And I have to protect the reputation of the Africa Room, because if we don't keep time, they will say those people in the Africa Room um, are messing with the conference schedule. So it, that is also part of the mandate I have here today. Um, but what I have to do, you guys, um, you are no doubt uh, very apt and agile. I had a question and I would have afforded you a paragraph or a sentence, I cannot do this. I need a word from you, right? A single word from you, maybe three words, no more than three. Bringing us back to realizing coverage in UHC, what is the most important word that you say we need to walk out of this room thinking of as participants at the World Health Summit? And? Access. Access. <laughs> Don't clap yet. Don't clap yet. I haven't graded them yet. Accelerating the achievements of the SDGs. Okay, accelerating the achievements of the SDGs. More than three words, Dr. Wah, but I'll take that. I'll take it. National action. National action, Tisha. I'll say health equity. I thought she would say technology. I was wrong on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Minister, one word. I know you're also a politician, but I want one word from you. <laughs> Investment would be the word. Okay. <laughs> that was the word. That was the <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. I think what a, what a strong start uh, today. And I want to thank my panelists here for, for your input. Thank you also for your questions. There were also some insights there. Uh, there weren't questions, but really we benefited from all of your input. I really wish we had more time. And I think that's the case for the organizers next year, that we need more time. Thank you so much uh, to my panelists and Tatiana uh, Gittini Tisha, and of course, Your Excellency. Thank you so much for the translation you provided. And um, yes, please come around, make sure that you get your questions before they leave. And um, let's continue the conversation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye.